Well, come on, somebody make some noise if you're glad to be in church today. Come on. Welcome. Welcome to those of you in person, online, on television, the hundreds of prisons joining us from 49 states right now. Come on, church, put your hands together. It is an honor to be with you. Matter of fact, last week um, I had the chance to meet uh, quite a few guys who joined our church behind bars and have since been released and were here in person after the last service. I got to spend some time with them. And um, here's a picture. I brought a picture with me. Um, kind of funny story. So w- one of the guys standing next to me, um, he looks me up and down and up and down. And uh, he says, bro, you look better on TV. <laughs> So I'm not going to lie. I said, well, I wouldn't want you to lie. Now, I I did just get done preaching three services. Fatigue is setting in, but whatever. Um, Nice to meet you, too. And then then another guy, uh, he said to me, Pastor Chad, um, two things. He said, one, I have a 14-year-old daughter like you do, and um, I just, I need you to pray for the restoration of, of this relationship. And, and number two, he said, I feel the call of God on my life like you do. And as we stood there and talked, I could um, just sense, I, I could just feel the, the hand of God on his life. And, and I could sense how his heart had been changed and transformed during his time in prison. And I, I, I looked at him and I said two things. Number one, You keep fathering your daughter and you keep praying over her and for her and God will restore that relationship. And number two, I can sense the hand of God on your life and he is going to use you to make an incredible difference for his kingdom. Why? Because we serve a God of second chances and third chances. Amen. We serve a redeeming God, a restoring God. And um, I I brought this with me today too. I just thought I would share this with you. I I was thinking about it this week and um, I I got this uh, letter and artwork from... Tara, Tara, if you're watching right now, thank you for this artwork. Um, this was sent from Tara, um, and she's behind bars, and um, got this around Christmas time, and she, she wrote this letter. First of all, the, the artwork is just incredible. I mean, if you can see this, uh, the reason I framed it is because I wanted it in my office, so it's been framed in my office ever since Christmas. But Tara writes, she says, Pastor Chad, I'm one of the 450,000 in prison that you reach every Sunday. I want to tell you how thankful I am for COVID blessings, such as Rock City on TV. If you could sit on a bunk as I do every week and see how many of our TVs are tuned in to watch every week, you would see the impact you're making in so many lives. My favorite part every week is seeing how many heads are bowed at the beginning or at the end of the message and women who are receiving Jesus as their savior. People who would not normally attend church during regular times. She says, Merry Christmas to you and to the entire Rock City team. Come on, church, can we we thank Tara for just that encouraging letter and awesome piece of artwork. The the reason I I wanted to share that with you and just, uh, just, just share the story from last week with you is because we, as you know, Um, We pipe our weekend worship experience into uh, more than 350 prisons in 49 states. And um, and the letters that we receive, the impact that's made, it it is just incredible. Whether it's um, men or women serving weeks, years, um, even letters from death row, how God is just making an impact on death row through um, through these services. We, We are in four local facilities. Um, we have physical teams in four local facilities that actually we don't just pipe in a, an experience. We, we bring an experience w- w- to them. And, um, and, and that, that on September 2nd will become not just four local facilities, but five. So we're going to have the opportunity to be in five local correctional facilities with teams bringing a worship experience to men and women behind bars. And we have invitations to do five more. So we could go from four to 10 really quickly. But you you know, an invitation is only so good as the, 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 the amount of people willing to say, Count me in. So um, I'm, I'm, let's, look, we, we, we not only need manpower, but we, we need the willpower. We, we need the willingness of uh, men and women to step up. And so I'm just going to ask you um, if you would be willing to participate with us in prison ministry. 
Um, a ministry that I think is one of the most fulfilling ministries in the whole church. I've, I've never been more inspired than when I've been a part of a baptism experience, a worship experience, baptism in a prison yard outside. It is insane. I mean, just I, one of the most incredible church experiences I've ever had was in a prison yard doing baptisms outside. And um, I wish everybody could experience this. And so if you would say, Chad, I, I'm willing to, to step up. I want to go from, I want to see our church go from four locations, f physical locations in, in the state of Ohio to 10. I want to be a part of that. Would you just email us at prison at rockcitychurch.tv today, tomorrow, this week? We're not going to send you behind bars untrained. We're going to train you. We're not, we're not, we're not going to send you alone. We're going to send you as part of a team. But um, I'm just asking you, please, 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 would you, um, would you just volunteer? Give your time. We, we, need, we, need, we need people who are committed to being there every week and um, at least as many weeks throughout the month as you can. And, um, and people with a heart for those that are largely forgotten. Can, can you do that? I mean, do, do you think we're going to have enough willpower and manpower? Anybody willing? Can, can, we, can we do this together, church? Come on. Can we do this? Because I, I would hate to see, you know, five more invitations, just open invitations, and, and us not able to, to actually make those moves. So we're ready as long as you are. So, Lord, would you, um, would you just move in our church? And God, for this in particular, would you move in our church? May we be inspired and even convicted to live out our faith in a way that maybe we've not been living out our faith. Would you compel many in this church to get in the game and to begin to serve in this capacity and in, in every other capacity where there is a need? We pray continually for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan and around the world, the persecuted church. We, we pray, God, for those who are in the Gulf Coast preparing for just a violent hurricane right now. We pray for your peace and protection over them and your continued peace and protection over your church here. Every heart, every home, every person. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Well, come on one more time. Would you put your hands together for Jesus today? I'm excited about this new series that we start today. We think it's a really big deal. Every week, we're going to bring to you a, a different it. But every week's it is going to point back to today's it, what we think is the most important it. It is what Jesus gave his life for. And how many of you know if Jesus gave his life for it, it must really matter? Amen. And, and the it I'm talking about is the mission. The mission. Jesus gave his life for the mission. Now, if you're not sure if that's true or not, just hold on. I'm going to get there. When it comes to the Christian faith, though, there are a lot of phrases we tend to use that only Christians really understand. The mission might be one, but I think there's some better Christianese examples that I can give you. Um, and Christianese is, is just it's what it sounds like. It's a language that Christians use that only Christians really understand. Like, um, I'll give you some examples. We talk a lot about bearing fruit, right? Bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. But how many of you have ever been to a church where there was a fruit basket in the lobby? Anybody? Like, you've never seen actual fruit in church, like, but we talk about fruit all day long. Or how, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, have you been washed in the blood? Like, hey, I, I found this church, it's Rock City. It's like, really? Are people washed in the blood there? And you're like, I don't know. I'm not, I don't think so. M maybe, what are we, I'm not sure I understand what we're talking about. Or maybe somebody comes up to you in the lobby, and they're, they're kind of attractive, actually. Um, so you're like, all right, let's talk. And then they say, they invite you over tonight for some Christian fellowship. And you're like, Christian fellowship, like, is that where the laying on of hands takes place? Like, I'm not real sure. Like, well, what are we talking about here? I need to know what I'm getting into. Or what about this phrase? Uh, it, it's a phrase that not even pastors understand, and that's the phrase, in conclusion, come on, somebody, or, or I'm, I'm bringing this to a close right now. You've been bringing it to a close for 45 minutes like nobody believes you. Um, we also tend to use the word me a lot in the church. We use the word me a lot. And, and matter of fact, if you, if you were a part of church as a child, maybe you went to Sunday school, you, you may have sung this song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells who? 
tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We, we use that word a lot, Jesus loves me, uh, Jesus died for me, Jesus rose from the dead for me, and, and we tend to, a lot of the time, think about what does God want for me, what does God have for me, what's my purpose, my place, what's my calling. And, and what happens is, is, is we, we start, we, we tend to, to, to believe that, that the entire Christian faith or that the entire Christian experience is really centered on me, right? Like that I'm the, the center of the Christian faith. I'm the focus of the Christian faith. We, we, we really start to believe that, that we are the focus. I'm the focus of the church, right? Like the church exists to serve Christians' needs. The church exists to, to cater to church people. And we show up to church wanting to know, God, what do you have for me? What am I going to get from this? What's the pastor going to give me, teach me? What's in it for me? And, and th there is truth in saying that Jesus died for me. Jesus loves me. Th there's truth to that. But, but, but it's not the whole truth. And, and I would say it like this, that, that if the foundation of your faith is, is only based on a partial truth, then that foundation is weak, not strong. And, and I would even go another step and say that if the foundation of your faith is on anything or anyone but Jesus, your foundation is wrong. Can I get an amen from somebody? <laughs> if your foundation is based on anything but Jesus, your foundation is wrong. Wrong. The foundation of the Christian faith is Jesus. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. Jesus, it's all about Jesus. So as we start this series and we start getting into some it's, and we're, we're going to unpack over the next six weeks 12 values that this church is based on or built on, and they're, they're all put in place that to, to, to really accomplish the, the first it that I'm going to spend a few moments on today, and that is the mission. We get our mission from Jesus. It is all about Jesus. And when it's all about Jesus, then Jesus' word is the only word that should ever really hold true weight in our lives. We take our cues from Jesus if it's all about Jesus. We get our inspiration from Jesus. We, we take our marching orders, not from a pastor, but from Jesus if it's truly all about Jesus. And though it is true to say Jesus loves me and Jesus gave his life for me and, and Jesus was raised from death to life for me, that is true. The whole truth is for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that, say this next word, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So it's true that Jesus loves you, but it's also true that Jesus loves the world, amen? It, it's true that Jesus died for you, but it's also true that Jesus died so that anyone who calls upon his name will be saved. That, that, that you're not the only one that he's worried about. You're not the only one that he's, he's focused on. Jesus loves you, but he loves the people around you just the same. It's also true to say that if you were the only one that had sin in your life that Jesus needed to die for, he certainly would have still come to die for you. If you were the only one with sin, Jesus would have still come. He'd have still given his life to die for just you. Why? Because that's how good of a God he is, right? He's better than you and me. He's incredibly good. And so he would have come for you if only for you. But the reality is he didn't just come for you because you're not the only sinner in the house. Just like I'm not the only sinner in the house. Jesus came so that the world might be saved. Amen? Because that's how good he is. And we need to understand this about Jesus, that, that Jesus came to, to, to give his life over Come death, hell, and the grave. He, he died on a cross to defeat sin. He was raised from death to life to defeat sin so that anyone can be saved and forgiven of sin. But, but understand that, that we're not saved only to be sure and secure. We are saved to be sent. I'm just laying some foundation before we dive in today. So, so the foundation is Jesus, and so we need to understand Jesus, what he said, what he lived, what he did, what he's called us to, but, but we also have to understand that Jesus came to save us, but not just so that we would be sure and secure, even though that comes with salvation. I'm sure that I'm saved. I'm sure that I've been forgiven. I'm 100% secure in the fact that when I leave this life, this side of heaven, I'm going to be in heaven with Jesus forever. I'm, I'm guaranteed heaven. I'm 100% sure I get that. But that's not the only reason I'm saved. I'm saved to be sent. I'm saved to follow 
Jesus, to live like Jesus, love like Jesus, lead like Jesus, and not all by myself, we are called to follow Jesus together. And so what we are going to do in this series is we're, we're going to try to get rid of the word me as much as possible and replace it with we because we need to understand we've been saved to be sent. We need to understand that we are the church that Jesus promised to build and never stop building, that we have a purpose, we have a calling, we have a mission that we've been called by God to fulfill together, that we are saved to be sent That's why we say our mission is to make heaven full, period. That there is no other mission that matters more than this mission. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? We are are saved to be sent. The only thing that really matters is the mission. Not just am I going to heaven, but are the people that I love going to heaven? Like, like, do I really want to be in heaven if I'm the only one I know there? The answer is yes, technically. (laughs) I mean, let's be honest. It has to be yes. Like, if I were to ask you, do you really want to be in heaven if you're the only one you know there? Yes. If you understand heaven and you understand the reality of hell, yes. But do you really want to be the only one you know there? No. We've been given a message. We've been given a purpose by God. See, we think the mission that Jesus has given his church is a really big deal. If it came from Jesus, it must be good. If he gave his life for the mission, then it must be a mission that matters a lot. And I know we've got this personal, private relationship with Jesus that we're called to live out and walk out, but we've also got a purposeful and public relationship with Jesus that we've been called to live out and to work out. Sometimes I think in the church, we we tend to get so focused on our personal, private relationship with Jesus that we end up neglecting what's most important to him. And that's the mission. Something incredibly powerful happens when the church is awakened to these age old, this age old idea that I'm not what's most important, the mission is. And we saw it last week when I asked the church, when I asked all of us, when, when we had an opportunity to give together toward Afghan relief and rescue. And church, in 24 hours, we were able to provide more than $640,000 to help our Afghan brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, that's something I couldn't have done all by myself. Come on, somebody. My family was a part of that giving as well. But this is something we got to do together. And I I spoke with our partner on the ground, just so you know, this week in Afghanistan. and, And over the weekend, 119 young boys were rescued in the dark of night from jihad camps in Afghanistan. And... um And, and I, was all, I was also told that 38 um, of, of the house church leaders had, had already been executed within the first week of the Taliban takeover and that the Taliban are literally going house to house, door to door, looking for these Christian leaders to execute them. And so many of the Christian leaders, what we're, what we're finding out is many of these Christian leaders are like, look, we're, we're marked for death. We likely will die. We know where we're going when we do die. So why don't we make the most of it? And instead of just hiding, they're mobilizing. Why? Because they believe and they they know that the mission is a really big deal. The mission matters. They understand that, that Jesus calls us to more than belief. He calls us to follow. They understand that it takes faith to believe, but it takes even more faith to follow. They understand that it, 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 there's risk involved in following. There's, there, there's not a whole lot of risk involved in believing. Matter of fact, I would challenge your belief with James chapter 2, verse 19. It says, you believe that there is one God good for you, but hey, even the demons believe that. And they shudder and they shake and they tremble at the thought of God, at the mention of his name. Now, when's the last time you shuddered at the mention of God's name? Might it be that the belief that demons have in God is a bit greater than the belief that you have currently in God? 
that at the mention of his name, they, they shake and they, they tremble. Belief is where it starts. Believe in your heart, confess in your mouth, but it's not where it ends. It's, it's the beginning, not the end. Belief isn't the goal. Following Jesus is the goal. That's why of all 12 values that this church is built on, the first is we, we sort of call it the, the mother of all values or the value of all values. And, and, and that is that while we're on mission, we are becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus. While we're working with the Holy Spirit, while, while we've been invited with Jesus to, to come alongside of Jesus in his spirit at work through the church, we're not doing anything in our own strength. The Spirit of God empowers his church, but we're, we're on mission with Jesus. While we're on mission, we are becoming day by day, step by step, moment by moment, fully devoted, all in wholehearted followers of of Jesus, by the leading of his spirit, by the direction of his word. Jesus calls his first disciples in Matthew chapter four, and it says that as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will, watch this, send you out. We're saved to be sent to fish for people, which means I'm telling you your purpose before you even get out the boat. And yet how many Christians will sit in a church their whole life, never really making a difference for the kingdom of heaven because, well, I'm just trying to figure out what my purpose is. I'm still trying to figure out what my fit is. I've just not found my place yet in the church. I just don't really know where I'm, I'm supposed to be used yet. Nobody's really asked me to do a whole lot of anything. Well, that's not this church. Church, you're getting, you're, you're getting asked every single week to engage. Our purpose is to make heaven full. Our purpose is to share Jesus that we've received with the world in desperate need of Jesus. Our purpose is to share the hope that we've been given in Christ with the world that is hopeless apart from Christ. That is our purpose. Before you even take one step in the faith, the moment he calls you, the moment he saves you, you need to know there's a purpose attached to your salvation, and it's not heaven only. It's making heaven full with the life that you've been given to leave to live before you get to heaven, while you're on your way to heaven. And it says that once they, they left their nets and they followed Jesus. Then going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets, and Jesus called them. And immediately they left their boat and their father and followed Jesus. I could believe all day long and and never be moved to action. I, I can believe all day long and stay stuck in my home all day long. I, I can believe all day long and never share my faith with anybody or make a difference for anybody or anything. A follower doesn't choose his mission, he's given a mission. A follower doesn't choose her own path, a path is chosen for her. A follower doesn't make the orders, a follower follows orders. Come on, somebody. A follower, a believer can believe all day but never leave the comfort of his own home and, and believe that the kingdom of God is being advanced around the earth but not take any part in advancing the kingdom of God throughout the earth. That's why Jesus said, did, didn't say, hey, Simon, Andrew, James, John, how much do you believe in me? Come on, can, can you just tell me how much you believe in me? No, Jesus said, come follow me. I'm going to send you out. I'm going to make you fishers of men. A follower does what the person he's following does. A follower goes where the person she's following goes. A, a follower adopts the mindset of the person he's following, the heart, the passion, the resolve, the intensity, the focus. Otherwise, they're not following When it comes to following Jesus, we, we need to ask ourselves, well, what did Jesus come for? What does it look like to follow Jesus? What, what, did, what did Jesus come for? What, what does Jesus really want with me? I think we see it quite well in Luke chapter 4. First time Jesus steps up to the podium and, and declares publicly his intention, his purpose, his, his mandate. Remember when the word mandate wasn't so ugly? Anybody remember the day? Let, let's, let's just say his mission, his mission. 
When he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Jesus is saying, I've been sent by the Father. And church, we need to know that just as Jesus was sent by the Father, we too are sent by Jesus. Recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And immediately, Jesus begins his work, his Talk's not cheap. He declares the kingdom of heaven is here. He, he starts to heal sick people. He, he starts to, to, to invite people to follow him that even the disciples are confused about. Like, I don't know if you really want that, that girl to follow you. I don't know if you really want him. Come on, you, you don't really know him like we know him. He's got a reputation. And Jesus is like, I don't care about his reputation. I'm going to change that anyway. Come on and follow me. Follow me. And then in Luke chapter 19, I, I, I wonder if, if Jesus just started thinking scalability. You know, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I'm saving you to send you out. But, but I, I need to give you a mission that you can remember. And, um, and, and maybe he's starting to think about Luke 4 and, and how, you know, he, he's got some smart followers, but he's also got some dumb followers. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there are smart people and not so smart people in the world. And so maybe he started hearing people like, okay, we're supposed to oppress the released and, and uh, we're, no, 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 release the oppressed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And we're supposed to um, open like um, doors for people. No open blind eyes. Right. Okay. Open blind eyes. You know, um, man, there, there were like a few more. And what he does in Luke 19 is he, he takes everything in Luke chapter 4 and he boils it down, maybe for scalability's sake. Hey, I need everybody to know this. I need everybody to understand this. And he just says this, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. Period. I've come to seek and save the lost. End of story. And the mission that Jesus came for is the same mission that we've been invited to participate with Jesus right here and now. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. We've been called to seek and save lost people. Matthew chapter 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is giving us not just a great commission, but the great commission, the greatest commission that's ever been given. No commission ever comes even close to this one. What this means is, is it means that that you are the mission so long as you're lost. If you're lost, you're the mission. When you're found, you're no longer the mission. You're invited to be on mission with Jesus. Now, this is a message that gets uncomfortable for a lot of church people because we think we're the mission. And we like to be the mission. But what Jesus wants us to understand is you're the mission so long as you're lost. But when you're found, the moment you're found, the moment you're saved, you're no longer the mission. You're invited to be on mission with Jesus. And I think he makes it so clear in Luke 15. He tells three stories back to back to back. First story. Jesus says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one lost sheep until he finds it? When he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home, then calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I found my one lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need not repent. In other words, Jesus gets more excited about one lost person found than the best worship experience we could ever have together, all believers. That's story number one. Story number two is this. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I've found my one lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Okay, if you, if you still don't get it, then Jesus 
talking to you, I guess, is going into story number three. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, and there was a severe famine in that whole country, he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went back to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son. The father threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best road and put it on him. Let's put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. So they began to celebrate. Let me give you just a few thoughts from these three stories. Number one, Jesus is for the one. If you can't see it in those stories, I don't know what you can see, but Jesus is for the one. And so one of our values is we are for the one. If Jesus came to seek and save the lost, we too will seek and save the lost until every lost one is found. Why? Because that's what it looks like to follow Jesus. Matter of fact, since this church launched 10 years ago in Columbus, we've seen 27,031 people say, I'm choosing to follow Jesus. Come on, somebody. 27,031 people say. (laughs) There's an entire subdivision in heaven with Rock City's name on it. I I love that, man. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. But you might say, well, what what do you mean by lost? Well, how do you define what's lost and what's found? Who's lost and who's found? Well, let's listen to what Jesus said in John 14, verse 6. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is is saying, I'm going to draw a line between lost and found. And the only difference between the lost and the found is it's Jesus, it's me. You want to be found? It's through me. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. The the wage of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It means I'm lost because of sin. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. The only one with the power to forgive us of our sin is Jesus. Jesus, again, is saying the only difference between lost and found is me. It's Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Why? Because nobody could do for you what Jesus has done for you. Nobody's been willing to do for you what Jesus was willing to do for you. And that's why everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. So according to Jesus and according to the gospel, the, 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 the line has been clearly drawn between lost and found. Those who are found have clearly put their faith and trust in Jesus. Those who are found have been forgiven of their sin by Jesus, have been saved by Jesus. Those who are lost have not yet been forgiven by Jesus, have not yet put their faith and trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord of their life. Our mission as those who've been found is to be on mission with Jesus sharing the life we've been given by Christ with the world. And not only that, but, but here's another value, and we see this in the stories. Not only are we for the one, but we celebrate. 
If, if heaven will celebrate every lost one found, then we will celebrate every lost one found. Why? Because everyone has a name and every name has a story and every story matters to God. We celebrate when lost people are found. We celebrate when God does a work in somebody's life. We get excited about it. We talk about it. We celebrate it. We, we join in with heaven. But, but just like not everybody found is on mission, not everybody found is always willing to celebrate. Let's be honest. Matter of fact, you can see it in, in the story. Jesus continues with that last story. And he says, meanwhile, the older son was out in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. Just to let you know, that's a, that, that might be the first mention of a church that knew how to turn up the volume and really worship because he just got near the building and he could tell there's something going on inside those walls. Like that's a church that's going on. So he hears the music, he can tell there's dancing, so he called one of his servants and he said, what's going on? And the servant replied, your brother's come and your father killed a fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. But the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, like, like he made the decision to leave, everything that's come to him, he, he deserves it. Like he made that decision. I've, I've been home. I've been in the church. Like I've been sitting here for years and years and years. And, and now I'm the one who feels neglected. You know who the person is that feels neglected in the, in the church? It's the person who's not on mission. You know the person who always feels like my needs aren't getting met? It's the person who's not meeting anybody else's needs. Because when you're on mission, you don't have time to worry about you. When you're on mission, you don't have time to think about your needs because you're busy meeting other people's needs. When you're on mission, you, you understand the church doesn't exist to cater to church people. The church exists to bring hope and life and healing to the world. This son of yours comes home and you kill the, the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you're always with me. I wonder if like, there's like a, a read between the lines. Sometimes I kind of wish you weren't, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate. We had no choice but be glad. Why? Because this brother of yours was dead but is now alive again. He was lost but now he's found. Man, I hope we can get this as a church. I had somebody email me not too long ago, said, I feel like all you do is talk about the prisons. What about us? Like, like all you do is care about lost people. What about us? I've had people literally get mad at me or our team and leave the church because they'll, they'll say things like, it feels like you're only ever concerned about lost people. Yeah, kinda. <laughs> <laughs> e even though I do think we do a pretty good job of caring for the needs of church people, if you'd engage, get on a team, be a part of a small group, you're, you're, you're going to be cared for. I just can't imagine how, how frustrating it must be for God sometimes to look at his, his found kids. And all, all we want to do is sit in a room and sing kumbaya together all day long. And, and he's got all these lost kids out in the world. And he's just waiting for his found kids to go find his lost kids and bring them back home again. Because lost kids are no less God's kids than found kids. You, you, you're going to be challenged in this church to engage. And if you don't want to engage, that, that's okay. Like, like go find a, a church with a, a pastor who, who is content to tickle your ears as long as you need to be tickled and wants to make you feel good all the days of your meaningless life. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> We're not the mission. They are. We can have a potluck every day of the week and not bring anybody to heaven with us. Be fat on the things of this world, but, but be broke when it comes to what really matters. When you understand what's at stake, life and death, heaven and hell, and not because some people deserve hell more than others. Let's be honest, church, we all deserve hell. <laughs> the one thing that separates those who are on their way to heaven from those who aren't 
It's Jesus. And Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7. He says, wide is the gate and, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. There's a lot of people on that road. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. And I would say we, we have a big part to play in that. That I wonder if so few will ever find it because the people who know the way refuse to show the way. The people who have hope refuse to share hope. You know, the world has never been concerned about being pushy. Culture is not afraid to be pushy. Culture will just say, bow down. Do what we tell you to do. Say what we want you to say. Use the language that we give you. We'll tell you what's okay to use and what language we don't want you to use anymore. We'll tell you what worship looks like. We'll tell you how to behave. We don't care about being pushy. All the while, the church has been wussy, wussy. Like we're afraid to invite somebody to church. We're afraid to talk about Jesus. We're, we're, we're afraid, and yet we've got the one name. Come on, somebody. We've got the one name. We know the one name with power to transform lives. We, we know the one name with the power to bring hope and healing to the world. Jesus, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You want truth? It's Jesus. You want to know the way? It's Jesus. You want life? It's Jesus. Everything this world is desperate and dying for, it's Jesus. We have the answer, church. Are we willing to share Jesus? Are we willing to push harder than the world is willing to push? Because we've actually got something that works. His name is Jesus. And I'm going to ask you right now to bow your head and close your eyes. I, I want to give you the opportunity to know Jesus. You who might say, I, I don't know if I'm saved. You draw the line between lost and found. I don't know what side of that line I'm on. I don't know if heaven is my home. I don't know if that can be guaranteed for me. I don't know if I've been forgiven. How can I know? Well, it does start with belief. Just know it doesn't end with belief. It starts there, though. Believe with your, in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And you'll be saved that he died for you and was raised from death to life for you, for us. That's where it starts. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. So if, if you would like to pray with me, just know two things are going to happen. One, you're going to be forgiven and saved. That means you're guaranteed heaven. Number two, you're going to immediately know your purpose. Immediately, you're going to be saved and invited into this incredible mission that, that Jesus has given his church to share the life that you're about to be given right now with as many people as you can. So would you pray with me? Jesus, here I am. I need you. You are Lord and you are Savior who died for me and were raised from death to life so that we could have life. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from the inside out. I trust you and I choose to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. Church, can we welcome our new family? Come on, somebody. Can we welcome our new family? Let me ask you to do just a few things. Now that we're all saved, everybody's saved. Now we're all on mission together. At least you're invited to be on mission. I'm going to ask you, if, if you need to ask the Lord this week to, to change your heart and give you a heart more like his, one that really begins to have concern for those who don't know Jesus, ask him for that heart. He'll give you that heart. And if you know how to share your faith, if you know how to tell your story, if you know how to lead any, somebody to Jesus, I, I would encourage you, look for an opportunity this week. Ask the Lord to just reveal to you an opportunity this week and, and just introduce somebody to Jesus. Just Tell them what he's done for you and 
Ask them if they'd be willing to pray with you. Well, we just, we, we just prayed together. If you're not sure that, that you're ready for that, then, then here's like newbie Christianity 101. It, it, take an invite card. We, we, we've printed tens of thousands of invite cards for this weekend so that everybody can take a stack, take a handful, leave them in the grocery store, leave them at the bookstore, leave, leave them at the coffee shop, pin them up on all the cork boards at Panera Bread and wherever you can find a cork board, just pin one up at, on that thing and, and pray that the right person sees it and picks it up. Find somebody that you work with and hand it to them and, and don't say you look like you, you, know, you need Jesus. Just, just say, just say um, hey, I don't know if this might interest you, but I, I think you might really enjoy our church. If you wanna meet me there, I'll meet you there. Just every card says, I'll, I'll see you at Rock City. <laughs> I would encourage you to uh, join, join our prison team. One of the most fun teams I think you could be a part of is our prison team. So again, I, just join the prison team and and see how God really does love those who are down and out. And Number three, we've got a ton of other teams and we've got a ton of small groups. So if you want to be in a small group or join a, any team, any team whatsoever, then get to Growth Track. Next week is Growth Track 101. It's step one. It's the best way that we know how to introduce you to the church and get to know you and just help you engage. You don't have to do this by yourself. We can do this together. Because Jesus said, go into all the world. This is an easy mission to understand. It's not so easy to live out, but it's an easy mission to understand. But when we live it out together, we make an incredible kingdom difference together. Amen? Are you ready? Are you willing? Can we do this? Come on, can we do this? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.